I have uh, some slides and some Python notebooks that I'll discuss. Um, the general overview that I'll try to stick to um, is give a kind of quick introduction to hadrons and QCD and what we mean by hadron spectroscopy. And in general, what I mean by QCD spectroscopy, since all these things are generated from the interactions of the quarks and gluons in quantum chromodynamics. Um, then we'll spend some time on assessing how to understand the hadron spectrum, and this requires uh, uh, some discussion on the basic principles of scattering theory. So we'll review basic ideas of scattering amplitudes and uh, non-perturbative features and how to uh, ascertain information such as bound and resonance state properties. As I said, if time permits, I'm, I'm only giving two lectures here. I'll discuss some of this connection with lattice QCD. Uh, if I don't get to this again, the videos from last year cover some of this and the Python notebooks I'm giving actually have some de uh, some uh, uh, some detailed dis discussion on this connection. Um, so there's a couple of reviews that I want to bring um, to your attention if you're interested in this sort of thing. Um, one is applications of hadron spectroscopy from well, from lattice QCD. Uh, so here is a quite a few years old now, but still a really good review um, on uh, using lattice QCD, which is this non-perturbative technique to calculate low energy nuclear observables uh, to compute hadron, uh, to, to compute the hadron spectrum. Um, and this is cast in terms of scattering processes, since that's how we understand the hadron spectrum, and I'll review that uh, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, but this review goes through kind of what the state of uh, state of the art was at this time. Uh, there's been a lot of progress since then, uh, primarily in doing multiple couple channel systems and uh, uh, advances in the baryon sector and three particle uh, uh, systems. But this is still a kind of good overview of uh, how this program works from the last QCD perspective. From the phenomenology perspective, uh, there is uh, uh, this review, which was done a couple years ago that I was a part of, uh, which comes from the point of view of the JPAC group. JPAC is the Joint Physics Analysis Center, uh, which is a international group of uh, physicists, both theorists and experimentalists, uh, who work together to try to construct uh, rigorous reaction models uh, to uh, study the hadron spectrum. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of from a two sided point of view, from one from pure theory uh, using computational lattice methods and one using experimental data uh, to uh, constrain reaction models and get out the hadron spectrum. And uh, this has kind of a wide discussion of various aspects and kind of uh, different case studies at different experiments. Um, if you're interested, I think these are both really nice reviews. Um, you know, this one's kind of self-serving because it's, you know, a lot of my work is in here as well. Uh, but I, overall, I think it's a nice review on kind of the state of the art for uh, phenomenological applications. And it gives, again, the general idea of what we're trying to do with this very, very complicated problem. Um, so for your benefit, um, and, and mine as well, uh, I have created a few different Jupyter notebooks using Python um, uh, uh, that illustrate some of the key ideas um, that I'll be presenting. They're all found in my GitHub page, which uh, uh, Paul mentioned was posted in the Discord chat. Um, if there, I'm in these notebooks, I'm not trying to use any fancy packages other than what comes with the Anaconda package manager. Um, this is a very nice package manager that has kind of stand, you know, the, the, the uh, many modules, but the primary ones that I use, uh, SciPy, um, NumPy, and so on and so forth, uh, Matplotlib, uh, these are all uh, contained here. And I think at this point, a lot of people are familiar with Python. Uh, so I chose Python for kind of its widespread uh, use and also kind of ease of uh, uh, learning. Uh, it's a very easy language to 
kind of get the basics and start running with it. It's got a lot of packages. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, um, you can try to contact me. I can try to come up with some, uh, I think I know of some tutorials or somewhere that has some information on how, on how to download this. But in, generally, uh, now the, the, the installation, the Anaconda package manager is pretty straightforward. Um, so hopefully just by going to the website here, um, you can see uh, how to do that. And let me take a detour from my slides to go and show you. All right, so this is um, the uh, GitHub page that I mentioned. Um, there's you know, two sections in here. One is lectures, which just has PDFs of the lectures that I'm presenting, so you have access to all of it. Summer 2023 is the lectures I'm presenting here. If you wanna see my PDFs from last year, they're, they're here as well. Um, I do not have links yet to the videos from last year, but Paul just sent me them. Uh, so I'll, I'll link those at some point. Um, in addition is the Python notebooks. Uh, so here are a few different sets that kind of do different things and plus some extra Python scripts that hopefully I'll do today. I'm going to try not to try not to speed through it, but you know, there's a lot to get through. So I try to hit the main points. Um, these, these Python scripts here, uh, aren't in a notebook yet because these are more recently developed and I just haven't had time, but essentially what they'll do is fit neutron proton scattering data, which I'll show as a case study, uh, in, in, in a little bit, and maybe we'll get to, to get through it today. Um, and then some of these exercises here um, concern different aspects that are very important for scattering theory. So one is just general introduction to complex numbers. Um, if you're not too familiar with complex numbers and complex analysis, it's a very important mathematical uh, uh, tool that we use in hadron spectroscopy. Uh, so this notebook here uh, does a basic review um, with some short discussion and some links that I like. And it does a, a short review on some basic aspects of uh, complex analysis if you're not too familiar with it, just, so, just a good idea. Or if you're not too, too familiar with using complex numbers and numerical computations. This also has some exercises on how to do basic plotting. Um, so take a look at this. I'm not gonna cover um, the details of this, um, but this is for your benefit. Uh, it's uh, Some people aren't too familiar with those aspects. Exercise one uh, covers general principles of scattering theory, which is what I'll be talking mostly about uh, today, again, with some references I, I enjoy um, and some links to some other summer schools hosted by the JPAC group on fundamentals of scattering theory. Um, and in here, this covers um, you know, different aspects of how to understand these scattering amplitudes, which I'll go through in detail. And I'll, I'll go through this notebook in a little bit more detail later. The last exercise concern is called Lucher, named after uh, uh, the, uh, the gentleman who developed the methods that link these scattering theory observables that we use in uh, hadron spectroscopy to finite volume energy levels, which are easily, uh, quote unquote, easily computed with lattice QCD techniques. Um, so this is kind of the final big notebook here, um, which again has some interesting links according to some that I showed before and uh, some discussions of basic aspects of finite volume physics. Um, so that's what's contained in here, and I hope to be covering some of these things here. Everything is in Python. Um, everything should work directly from here. Um, I do ask if you find errors or things that do not work, please let me know. At the top of these is uh, an email address that I can be reached by. Um, I want these things to work uh, in general and be publicly available, so please let me know. Uh, if or if there's anything kind of confusing. And over time, I hope these things mature and I can add more details to these things. So if you, you know, some years down the line, you are working in something related to spectroscopy, you know, oh, those Python notebooks were helpful, which is my hope. Uh, hopefully there'll be more things in there as things evolve. So this is the context of the Git repo, should be publicly available. Um, uh, I hope they're useful. Uh, no, okay. Um, so 
let me then uh, get started on the material proper. And I know not everyone is totally familiar with the ideas of having spectroscopy, so I'm going to give an overview and what this madness is about. So, in general, most people are, should be familiar with the standard model of particle physics in some detail, uh, uh, whether or not it's just the basic contents of her, the full blown mathematical theory. But in general, we have this uh, theory that I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise coming from someone. I don't know if it's a question. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, so, in general, the standard model is composed of different sectors. Uh, kind of generally organized in this fashion, where you have uh, fermions, which are the matter particles uh, uh, comprised of leptons and quarks, and uh, these interact with each other uh, via the gauge bosons, shown in blue here. Uh, the, the, the photon is the one responsible for electrodynamic interactions, the gluon here for strong nuclear forces, and the W and Z for, electro, uh, for the weak nuclear forces. Um, and there's also the Higgs boson, which is responsible for giving uh, some of these fundamental particles uh, a, a mechanism to generate mass. Um, I'm going to be focusing primarily on QCD, uh, which is the theory of strong nuclear interactions uh, between the quarks and the gluons. And one of the one of the interesting things about this theory is it's a very remarkable theory um, that is very simple to write down, uh, yet uh, there's a lot of richness to it that is very hard to extract, um, and I hope to at least give some flavor of why that's true. Um, so, just to make sure we're on the same page, let's go over uh, kind of what this theory looks like. But first, let's divert to quantum electrodynamics, which may be a little bit more familiar. So, this is a theory of electron and photon interactions. Uh, generally, we write the theory in terms of a Lagrangian. Uh, where you have uh, the electron fields or general lepton fields, which you know, the leptons that interact electromagnetically. Um, these lepton fields uh, interact via the photon fields uh, through this gauge covariate derivative. And, uh, it's, this has the interaction mechanism in there, which uh, we can write diagrammatically as an electron coming in, an electron going out, interacting with some photon. And the strength of this interaction is governed by the electromagnetic coupling, uh, which I write here as alpha. It's also called the fine structure constant. And um, the value of it is roughly 1 over 137. Uh, so this is a very small value. And we can generate uh, observables um, through perturbative methods. So this is kind of the usual technique where you find uh, something you want to calculate in some complicated theory, you expand in some small parameter, uh, and you get a first approximation that's kind of crude, and you can make refinements as you add uh, uh, new um, new terms order by order and some expansion coefficient. The expansion coefficient we use in quantum electrodynamics is the fine structure constant. Um, and so as an example, if we think of electron positron scattering, uh, we can cast these complicated mathematical objects in terms of Feynman diagrams, uh, which are just stand-ins for the, 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 the mathematical equations. And at lowest order, you have the electron and photon talking to each other, sorry, the electron and, and positron talking to each other via the exchange of single photons. Uh, so this is leading order in alpha. But you can also have corrections where you have two photon processes, uh, fermion loops, uh, and, and various uh, other kinds of uh, interesting interactions that when you take quantum field theory, you learn all these comp you know, complicated techniques in order to calculate these things, and you can make an industry out of this and, and, and calculate these corrections. And by and large, this technique works. So here is this example of electron-proton scattering at various uh, energies uh, between the electron-proton system, so 14, 22, so on and so forth, JEV, and different colors. And the points here represent uh, experimental data values as a function of the scattering angle between the electron and the positron, and the solid lines represent uh, theoretical uh, predictions um, up through second order, I believe. And you see it, you know, it, it generally works out fine. Um, so quantum electrodynamics is a huge success because of this, and it's the basis of all our modern theories of particle physics. 
quantum chromodynamics um, is uh, naively looks very similar. Uh, here we have uh, uh, quark fields, which interact with the gluon fields via this coupling. Uh, but the difference between uh, uh, quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics comes in a couple different ways. One, um, electrons uh, in, in have a positive and negative charge, whereas quark fields have a color charge of which there are different combinations that you can have. And there's three general colors, uh, which we call red, green, and blue. Um, and uh, because of this, you can have interactions uh, with the quarks with the gluon as before, um, but not just the quarks, the gluons themselves also have this charge, unlike in electrodynamics where the photon is, 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 is neutral, the gluons here do have this color charge, so you can have interactions um, of gluons with themselves, uh, either three quarks coming together or four quarks coming together, uh, sorry, three, three gluons coming together or four gluons coming together. Um, you can still write this uh, strong coupling constant, I call it alpha s here, um, in terms of the, kind of, uh, the, the coupling that appears in the, in the Lagrangian. Uh, however, um, at low energies, uh, which is the realm of hadron and nuclear physics, which yeah, I'm a nuclear physicist, so that's what I care about, um, uh, the, the strong coupling um, uh, is very, very large. And you can see here the running of the coupling as a function of the momentum transfer um, uh, of the gluons. And you see here that the coupling itself increases uh, as you get down to lower energies. And here are some kind of typical mass scales, uh, the upsilon mass, which is a, a, a B quark and anti-B quark meson, uh, the J psi, which is CC bar, and then the mass of the protons about here. And the coupling just explodes. And um, we don't really have a good handle on what even this coupling means at low energy. And the main idea here, and this is what makes QCD so unique in this sense, is that you don't observe free quarks. So we don't actually see quarks and gluons like we do in electrodynamics. In electrodynamics, we actually can observe electrons, positrons, and photons. Here, um, we at low energies, we observe hadrons, which are composite objects of quarks and gluons. And this feature um, means that when you want to try to do perturbative calculations, uh, diagrams at, with many different uh, loop contributions or at, at, at many higher orders can contribute at the same time as your leading order. So you have no sense of kind of approximation scheme that you're making uh, finer and finer corrections. Everything contributes all at once, and it's kind of a mess to do with uh, uh, in a perturbative sense um, at these low energies. Uh, so there's techniques around this. One is lattice QCD, which again, hopefully if I get time, I can discuss uh, probably next time. Uh, but one of the things here is, okay, well, nature, uh, this is supposed to be the ideal representation of nature here. Um, can we somehow connect QCD to what we observe in nature? And since we observe hadrons, we should discuss a little bit about what the hadrons actually are. So hadrons are uh, the color neutral uh, bound states of quarks and gluons. We don't observe free color. We only observe neutral uh, cases of uh, color. So red plus green plus blue is a colorless object or a red anti-red object is a colorless object. Um, and this is the main idea behind confinement. Um, there's two general classes of uh, hadrons that we observe. Baryons, uh, which are fermions, so spin one half or uh, spin half uh, particles. Um, and some examples of the proton and neutron are you know, well known examples. Uh, the delta may be less known, but it's, an, it's another example of a baryon. You also have the mesons, which are bosons. Um, these things are uh, uh, integer spin particles. And some examples uh, is the pion, which is uh, kind of what we think of as responsible for the long range exchanges between nucleons um, and kaons and etas are kind of the base examples for mesons. Uh, so the, th the thing we want to understand, you know, we have this kind of general idea of what baryons and mesons are in terms of QCD, but what are that we actually observe? And we have to discuss a little bit about spectroscopy 
uh, which is really trying to understand the content of some theory. So in this case, QCD, we want to understand it uh, in, in, in terms of understanding its components. Um, so just historically, spectroscopy, spectroscopy provides uh, a, a useful information toward understanding various physical phenomena. And one example that everyone should be familiar with if you've taken quantum mechanics um, is how the hydrogen atom and understanding the line specter of hydrogen uh, led to the discovery of quantum mechanics. So the idea behind spectroscopy is you have some beam uh, of gas, some hydrogen gas is collimated to some slit, uh, hits a prism, the prism then splits the, the, the light of the hydrogen gas into its uh, uh, base frequencies, its components, its spectrum. And um, the, the, uh, you can measure these spectrums on some photographic plate and you can get out the hydrogen emission spectrum. So in this case, in the visible range, you can think of getting like violet blue, some bluish green, and some red uh, tint here. So, uh, or some red lines. Um, so as a physicist, we're, we're trying to understand what the spectrum is in terms of the kind of the, the, the degrees of freedom at hand. So this is hydrogen gas. What's hydrogen doing to give us the spectrum? Uh, this led to quantum mechanics. And uh, if we go with a kind of simple uh, picture where you have a proton being orbited by an electron with some orbital angle, angular momentum L, uh, quantum mechanics, which I won't go through the, you know, the whole history of, but the idea with quantum mechanics is that you have some Hamiltonian, which describes your system um, and your state, which I call psi here, which is, is the electron, uh, is the bound electron system. You can get out the eigen uh, uh, energies uh, for the system. Uh, this is the Schrodinger equation. And from, uh, uh, you know, using your techniques, you can compute what the spectrum is and you get that the spectrum here is governed by the electromagnetic coupling, which is no wonder since this, there's electromagnetic forces holding the electron and proton together. And it's given in terms of some fundamental parameters like the coupling, the mass of the electron and some quantum numbers. So quantum numbers are uh, a set of, uh, oh, Joe, you're right. It should be N squared. Uh, that's a typo I have here, thank you. Um, yeah, this should be N squared. Um, apologies for that. So these quantum numbers are uh, characteristic quantum numbers that describe your uh, quantum system. And you can plot this, this is plotted correctly with the N squared um, for the different energy levels for different angular momentum modes. So zero angular momentum or S wave as we call it. Uh, one angular momentum, two units, since angular momentum is quantized. And you get this nice pattern in that you see uh, that we can actually observe in nature where you have uh, these energy levels of the hydrogen system. And indeed, it does match with what we see in the experiment. Um, uh, what we see from this hydrogen emission spectrum is just the transitions from some higher state to some lower state, and it gives off some frequency, uh, of some 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 photon of some frequency, which is what we observe here. So studying the spectrum of hydrogen led to the discovery of quantum mechanics, which in turn led us to kind of go back and study the spectrum and say, okay, do we really understand this? And it seems like we do. Uh, however, if you know we do things more precise and uh, uh, really uh, making sure we understand all the nuanced details, um, we can go back and do better precision experiments. And even this picture uh, is not the complete picture. We find here that, oh, there's not exact degeneracy as was predicted by Schrodinger equation. You get some splittings of the energy levels, which you, which come from say relativistic effects or quantum electrodynamic effects. And indeed, this is what also paved the way for quantum electrodynamics, seeing the small shift of the 2s one half and the 2p one half uh, uh, line spectra here. Um, uh, the, the land shift, which was observed and really helped uh, give uh, early uh, theorists who were developing quantum electrodynamics an observable that they can calculate and, uh, and show that this whole scheme really works. Um, so, you know, this is an iterative procedure. We study the spectrum, try to 
uh, understand the theory behind the spectrum, formulate better theories, go back, do more precision experiments, come back and make refinements to our theory. So this is how uh, uh, history of uh, physics works and juggling spectroscopy is a big part of this. So in the case of QCD, um, what do we have? Uh, well, hadrons are classified by their conserved quantum numbers, which is generally spin, uh, paired, heat charge conjugation, isospin strangeness, and other flavor quantum numbers that may exist. And here's a simple example um, that uh, uh, was observed. Uh, you know, the, the pions, etas, and cans were observed early on, and uh, Gelman was instrumental in kind of developing the early quark models to help describe this. And in part, was described the, the super multiplets with various quantum number schemes. And so here is the example of the pseudo scalars. So all these particles have spin zero and parity negative, um, and they have uh, different isospins, which are shown in colors here. So the isoscalar etas, the isovector pions, and the isospinner k-arms, and they have different strangeness quantum numbers and different electric charges. So the first kind of step when we're trying to understand the spectrum is just look at all the conserved quantum numbers at play and kind of organize this pattern. So we can, uh, instead of studying everything at once, we can study different sectors. So we can say, okay, we're going to tune experiments, um, get various quantum number sets out, and then break things up into these various uh, uh, sectors themselves. Um, when we do that, we can now start studying uh, more features about the spectrum. And this idea of the quark model gives a good idea of the growth structure. Uh, so here is uh, experimentally observed um, uh, uh, masses along with decay widths of various light isovector mesons. So by light here, I mean U and D quark uh, 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 compose and isovector, meaning that their total isospin is one. And this quantum numbers here, so their JPC, so their spin parity, charge conjugation. And uh, uh, these are various ones that are observed. And if we look at a simple quark model, Maybe we can get away with not, you know, doing a full blown QCD analysis. Maybe we can just get away with some simple quark model picture to get an idea. And it, it kind of works for some systems, uh, but mostly it doesn't work as I hope, hopefully show. Um, so we put a quark and an anti quark together uh, with quarks have spin and there's some orbital angular momentum. So this is similar to the electron proton picture. Um, and uh, we can write out their total quantum numbers, uh, JPC, uh, for spin singlet or spin triplet representations, and you get various quantum numbers. And if you do you know, maybe squinting a bit more for some of these lower energy ones, you find that you, you, you have a general pattern that does emerge. Um, the one P states seem to kind of fit in the, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the quark model prediction. You have the 1D states, the 2S states, the 1S states, maybe not so much, uh, which tells you that there's probably something else going on in the deep chiral dynamics that is primarily responsible for the light pions. Um, but, you know, it does an okay job. Uh, maybe maybe we can just do some simple re refinements of this. Um, however, uh, we're led immediately to say, well, can we do refinements of this? Um, we notice here that there are some forbidden quantum numbers that you cannot construct with the simple quark model picture. And uh, one of them here is say one minus plus, which happens to be a particle that is observed in the light isovector spectrum. So right away, uh, while you know some of these things have all been observed and generally fit, you're getting an observation of something that doesn't even fit this picture. So what's going on? And this, object here, uh, which has been observed by a few experiments, is uh, this and some of its uh, uh, cousins are under intense search of uh, at Jefferson Lab through the Blue X experiment to look for exotic hadrons, um, which is suspected this one is, uh, and I'll give examples of what I mean by exotic hadrons in, in a moment. Um, another thing that plays a big role here, uh, which is not captured by this uh, a simple quark model picture is the role of multi-particle dynamics. If we look at what scattering thresholds are available, we see here the pion, which is this this guy right here. Uh, but we see to get to the next uh, the next lowest particle in the sector, 
which is the one minus minus. This is the row mesine, if you've uh, been, uh, if you've heard of this thing, is above two pi on scattering thresholds, three pi on scattering thresholds, and four pi on scattering thresholds. Uh, so if you want to understand the row meson in full detail, ideally, your theoretical construction should have uh, some sort of uh, 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 should capture the reaction dynamics of these particles interacting. Since you know anything, so since since this is quantum mechanics, a state with some quantum numbers, any such basis set of states that have those quantum numbers could affect that particle. And indeed, these scattering channels do affect that. And what I argue is that all of these states here, uh, 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 you can we understand them by their reaction mechanisms. Um, another example um, where you see complications is the uh, in the heavy quark sector. Uh, so here I'm talking about the CC bar, so charm anti-charm sector. And uh, before 2003, um, the spectrum looked kind of like this. You have some observed states that are shown in blue. So the RPP is the review of particle physics. Um, that were observed in blue, and then states predicted by uh, this uh, uh, simple quark model picture um, are shown in gray here. And what we see is that, well, the states generally, uh, with, with a couple parameters fixed, generally you can reconstruct what looks like the spectrum. Sure, there's a little bit of deviation, but it looks much better uh, than, say, in the light meson spectrum. Uh, you know, things are generally fit and multiplex much better. You kind of see these structures appearing. Sure, there's some missing states, but that's just the job of experiment to fill out these missing states, you know. So maybe the quark model does a decent job for heavy quarks. You know, you know, so if these quarks are heavy, maybe it acts more like the hydrogen system uh, than it does for the light meson. So, you know, maybe we could just you know, focus on this. Uh, but after 2003, uh, a lot of these orange states were observed, which no longer seem to fit any of the predicted patterns uh, uh, that have, you know, you get these tight clusterings, uh, uh, particles uh, that fit, that that do not really fit the expected uh, excitation spectrum. And moreover, um, there's some evidence that these things come from four quark like objects, uh, which is not what the sector is supposed to describe. So indeed, we're getting into the same mess uh, that we saw in the light meson spectrum. Um, and what's interesting is that many of these states here are near scattering thresholds. In fact, all of them have been observed of the, uh, uh, the simplest charm, anti-charm uh, meson um, scattering threshold. So again, this is some indication that these quark models may do some good uh, to give you an idea, but in general, there's a lot of interesting things happening at play, which is ultimately uh, supposed to be governed by QCD dynamics. And one of those and one of those primary components is the fact that you have scattering thresholds, which give rise to a lot of interesting phenomena. So, in general, the landscape of a of QCD spectroscopy looks currently like this, um, where uh, you have uh, baryons and mesons again, but it's it may not be the simple three quark or quark anti quark picture. Uh, you could have pentaquark like objects, uh, which have been observed. Um, mo molecular states, which we know of already, these are just nuclei. We have baryons uh, uh, interacting interacting with, with each other with kind of a, a residual strong nuclear force. But in principle, you could have the same thing in the meson sector, tetraquark like objects. You could have objects that are known as hybrids, and that one minus plus guy that I showed a few slides back is an example where uh, it is thought that this is a hybrid candidate, where it's a quark anti quark object with some highly excited gluon interactions that are giving rise to the to to this uh, particle. So in general, this is what you know, and this is not everything. There could be plenty more, uh, but the situation is complicated, and the connection to QCD is more. Uh, is is really what we're after, but we need to first sidestep and think about how do we actually observe these these hadrons. And the way we do it is through uh, particle reactions. So we observe these reactions through accelerators. Um, in general, experiments measure some events which are related to cross sections, which um, 
if we had some theoretical uh, uh, construction, uh, we can relate that to the probability amplitude for the reaction to occur. And it's something like quantum electrodynamics, this object M here, which is the scattering amplitude or the reaction amplitude, we calculate order by order in perturbation theory and sum up to some desired order to, to construct the observable. For something like uh, QCD interactions, uh, we're left with doing other techniques. And what I'll show is uh, what we do is we use general principles of the scattering amplitude to write a, uh, a generic form that then we can parameterize all of our unknown, uh, uh, short, you know, unknown physics and then fit that to either um, experimental data as is, is what's on in, in phenomenology or to lattice QCD uh, energy spectra. But the idea here is that you have some beam on some target with some detectors and what happens is that your particles interact and the detectors will detect the particles and process up signal and this process goes on and on. You collect you know hundreds of thousands to millions of events for your uh, whatever reaction of interest. So this is what goes on in different accelerators here at Jefferson Lab, where I'm currently based, um, or uh, accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. The idea is the same. Um, for strongly interacting hadrons, um, if the interaction is sufficiently attractive, particles can form what are called resonances. Um, so a resonance is an unstable hadron, which most of the hadrons we see are unstable. Um, they decay to uh, other hadrons in a short, um, with, 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 with a short lifetime um, on the scale of the strong nuclear interaction. And uh, what you see here is some example of some hadron coming in. It makes some short-lived uh, resonance and then the particles decay away. Uh, so here, if you think about this as like a pion and a proton, they can interact to form a, to, to form a delta particle which lives for a short time. Uh, but you also have cases where you can form more particles. So here in the case, you have two to three particle reactions. And in general, this is a very complicated process where you can have any and everything that can happen with these quantum numbers can occur, um, unless there's some dynamic suppression that just by happenstance. Um, so this is what we actually do in uh, hydron spectroscopy. Uh, when we want to understand these things from nature themselves. And we collect all this data and, we, you know, initially we would think about resonances appearing as enhancements in the cross section or the amplitude itself. And here's the example of pions interacting with protons. So the red is pi plus, uh, pi, the positive charge pion interacting with the proton. The blue is a negatively charged pion acting with a proton. And you see here various features in the spectrum as a function of the beam momentum uh, in giga in electron volts. And this big beak here is associated with the delta resonance where the width of it is roughly related to its, uh, or it, it, we, we define the width to be um, uh, the inverse of the lifetime. And uh, we see some various interesting features here. We see some peaks, which, you know, a very kind of narrow big peak we've described, like this is the resonance itself. Uh, if that width was very, very narrow, that means this thing's longer lived. If it's very, very wide, that means it's very short lived. Um, but you see many other features here. You see some other bumps, some dips. And in general, uh, resonances themselves, um, you would say, well, maybe there's, you know, a few resonances hiding inside here. Um, but resonances are complicated objects uh, to really get the properties, which is to say the mass and the width, which is the spectrum. We need to study the structure of the reaction amplitude itself. When we do that with say this data here, we can extract out the spectrum, uh, which here again, JP quantum numbers. Here you see the proton here, or, the, or the nucleon. Here you see the delta. And you see all these other cases that were found in the data that I showed. So there's something more to it than just bump hunting um, resonant. You know, if you have resonances close to, to each other, you can get dips or kind of cancellations uh, from these supposed bumps or kind of dips. And you have to do a more rigorous analysis 
um, of the scattering amplitude proper, which is what I'll describe next. So the idea here, if we want to understand this spectrum from QCD, we want to connect experiment to scattering amplitudes, which is what I'll talk mostly about these lectures, most likely, um, and compute their spectral properties. We can classify the hadrons and learn patterns of QCD, and then connect these patterns to QCD itself. And this is where using techniques like lattice QCD is very uh, useful. So um, this is kind of the big picture plan. And the next thing I wanna discuss is some aspects of scattering theory and the hadron spectrum. And I realize we're already kind of going long, um, but maybe let me pause here, see if there's any questions. And then maybe, I know I have it to 11.30, but I don't want to uh, drone on and on. So I'll go for a, a little while longer uh, after some questions. Any questions? Doesn't seem like it. Um, all right, so I'll continue on for a little bit. Um, Believe not drawn on too much. Uh, so an example here that I'm going to talk about with doing this process is the deuteron. So the deuteron is the simplest nucleus that exists. It's a bound state of the proton and the neutron. Um, nuclear physicists often call it the hydro nanonuclear physics, since you learn a lot about the nuclear forces by studying this object here. And what I'm going to present is um, how we do the hadron spectroscopy for these more, you know, that we do in general for this very simple case. So, you know, if you want to study deuteron physics, this may be a little overkill, um, but I, I think it illustrates the example in a nice way. So, the deuteron itself. We want to understand its spectral properties. So what's its mass, what's its lifetime, what's its spin, its parity. Uh, can we get any size information like from its, you know, like its chart, like, um, like its radius? Uh, can we get its charge? Uh, what about its couplings to any, uh, to any multi-particle modes? All this stuff um, we would like to get uh, uh, to understand the deuteron. And if we look at low energy neutron proton elastic scattering, it looks something like this. Um, and the blue points here are experimental data values. The red curve here is a theory fit uh, or, uh, or is a fit using a theoretical model for the reaction amplitude from which we can extract the properties uh, that I just, or at least some of the properties that I just mentioned. And um, Yeah, let me continue on from there. Uh, so some of the Python uh, uh, scripts I have do this fit, and I'll show that in a moment, or well, maybe at the end of this. So the idea is then, how do we convert this experimental data to properties of the neutron, or sorry, properties of the deuteron? Well, let's just take a look at some basics. So first, just some basic kinematics of the proton and neutron. Um, the proton and neutron masses are nearly equal. This is where the origin of isospin comes from. Uh, the, the proton and neutron the, uh, are just different isospin projections of a more general object called the nucleon. So this is very similar to spin up and spin down. Uh, here it's isospin up, isospin down. Um, since the proton and the neutron mass are very similar, and I'm working in units where h bar c is equal to one, um, uh, uh, we will make the assumption uh, that we're working in what's called the isospin limit, where I'm going to take the proton and neutron to be mass degenerate and just call this the nucleon mass. And just for the stuff I'm going to show here, I'll just take this as 940 MeV. You can be a bit more precise, or you can actually deal with this mass splitting for actual experimental data. But for the precision I'm after, which is not very precise uh, uh, for these exercises here, I'll just stick with 940 MeV. Um, we're going to work with relativistic kinematics. Now for very, very low energy um, uh, nuclear physics, you can, you know, relativistic effects may not be that important. Um, however, for the energies I'm going with neutron proton scattering itself, you know, these relativistic, these relativistic effects could give some percent level deviations. But in general, what we do in hadron spectroscopy, we usually are working in the relativistic regime anyway. So I'm just gonna formulate everything 
uh, with relativistic kinematics um, as that is kind of the working tools that we use. So if you have a neutron uh, moving with some momentum P, just defining what our terms are here. So the momentum P and the energy, which I'm gonna call omega of P um, is fixed uh, by the usual relativistic dispersion relation, uh, which is the square root of M squared plus P squared. So this is the moment, this is a momentum and energy of a nucleon and the non-relativistic limit, you can expand this out and you get the usual rest mass or, or rest energy uh, plus the kinetic energy term, which you're familiar with in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, as I said, we're gonna stick with the, uh, just the relativistic form. Uh, there's no computational advantage really in going to the non-relativistic form. Uh, we can also define the kinetic energy itself, which is just omega minus m. Uh, in the non-relativistic case, you see immediately it's the kinetic energy in, in general. This is just how we define the kinetic energy. Um, and just some exercises here, you know, prove this if you're uh, not too familiar with how to do it. Uh, just use a Taylor expansion. Um, if we have two nucleons together, um, what do what does Kind of how do we how do we describe its kinematics here? So the total energy would be just the sum of the individual nucleon energy. So here the proton neutron, p1, p2, and total energy then is the sum of the two different energies. Often we want to trade one of the momentum for the total momentum p of the system. So I call this capital P is the total momentum of the system, which is simply p1 plus p2, which means that we can trade p2 for the total momentum and then the momentum of particle one. So there's always two different momenta we have to deal with either P1 or P2 or P1 and capital P being the total momentum. Oops. Um, so, you know, the, how, how you would expect the total energy would be for two particles. Um, but by looking at this in this way, um, if we choose a convenient rest or a, a convenient uh, reference frame, which in this case, I'm gonna choose the center of momentum frame. Um, the center of momentum frame is the frame where the total momentum is zero. And whenever I'm in this frame, I will use this little star superscript to indicate that. So the, the total momentum is zero, P star equals zero. Then the proton and neutron have back-to-back -back momentum, P1 and P2, uh, which are equal and opposite in direction. So I'm gonna call this special momentum Q star and then P star here, a P2 star will be minus Q star. So in effect, then in this reference frame, uh, the total center of momentum frame energy is twice the square root of M squared plus Q star. Um, I'll just make a quick note. This is also sometimes, sometimes called the center of mass frame, which colloquially it's fine. Uh, uh, in very technical terms, it's, it's different than the center of mass frame, but most people just use it to mean the same thing. Um, but I'll use center of momentum frame, so that's what it, it really technically is. So instead of uh, describing your system by the total momentum and the relative momentum, um, since the total momentum is zero, we can just describe the system with the relative momentum Q. So that's nice. And from this, we can find a relation. Uh, we can just invert this relation to where uh, if you have what the total center of momentum frame energy is, uh, you can find what, what the relative momentum is just by uh, this square root relation. So I'm just inverting the relation and you know show this. And also it's useful to plot this function uh, as a fun to plot the momentum as a function E. It should be square root like and uh, uh, we expand upon this in some of these notebooks. Uh, uh, as the square root feature is what gives rise to the interesting non-analytic behavior of the amplitude. Um, so let me go through then um, the amount of energy and momentum that is available to the two particle system. Um, this is called the kinematic phase space, which is the available kinematic configurations. And if you haven't had quantum field theory, you know, I'm just, I'll give you the answer at the end of the day. You don't need to worry about it. Um, if you had taken quantum field theory, this should be familiar to you uh, when you calculated, say, cross sections as the same quantity appears. So we define the Lorentz invariant phase space for two particles of some total momentum uh, going into some kinet 
some kinematic con con configuration for particle one and particle two as um, this first term, which is an energy conserving delta function. So all this means here is that if your target energy is some energy E, that the total energy must be shared between the two particles uh, by their sum, which is exactly what you'd expect. Uh, the two pi is just a convention that I'm using. Then you have a momentum conserving delta function, which is just saying that the total momentum is just the sum of the individual momentum. Well, obviously, um, this is how you mathematically formulate it. And then we're going to have integration measures for each of these particles. Um, and since I'm dealing with relativistic kinematics, I'm going to be dealing with uh, a Lorentz invariant form of this measure here, where you have three components of momentum. So this is why you have three components of this differential for say px, py, pz. Uh, this two pi factor is convention, and then the oh, and then the two uh, uh, two times the energy factor here is just what it, what ensures it's Lorentz invariant. I won't prove that here. You can find it in any standard quantum field theory textbook like Peskin and Schroeder. Uh, so we have a distribution for particle one and particle two. Um, so, okay, very nice, but why is this useful? Uh, well, this, if you manipulate this by essentially integrating out these delta functions, you can arrive at a function that is, that makes its way into our scattering theory over and over again, which is the space based function here. So after considerable mathematics, which I won't go through here, again, you can go through the exercise um, in some book. Uh, you can write this thing as uh, some um, some two times some rho factor here, which I'll define in a moment. Uh, the heavy side theta function, which is the step function that says, all right, the only allowed energies are greater than the threshold energy. You know, you can only have scattering occur if the energy is greater than twice the mass energy, uh, or 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 twice the mass of the proton and neutron system. Um, if it was less than that, the proton and neutrons would be scattering. Uh, then you have um, the integration over the orientation, which isn't fixed. So if you recall, let's back up real quick, you had this proton neutron system in the center of momentum frame where the momentum are going back to back. Uh, the magnitude of the momentum uh, was fixed by the energy. However, the orientation in space, it can be anywhere it wants. Uh, this orientation is free, uh, which that is what this is signaling here. So this is the solid angle that describes this momentum. Uh, and uh, this is what you can reduce this thing to. So for um, the threshold energy, which is associated with zero relative momentum for two nucleons, so at 940 MeV, um, at the threshold energy then is roughly 1880 MeV. This phase space factor here, is what's called the two body kinematic phase space factor. And it's given entirely in terms of energy. So it's given in terms of the relative momentum, which you can write in terms of that square root of the energy and eight pi times the, uh, times the energy in, in the denominator. Uh, this factor is going to appear again. So I felt the need to just describe it here, um, uh, just describing this available kinematic phase space that the two particles can go towards. Um, and then here, again, just another exercise, plot this function uh, as a function of E. And if you're really bold, derive this form. Uh, so uh, let me, all right, so um, for proton neutron scattering, this is essentially a binary reaction or a two to two reaction. We're not going to stitch in this idea together. As time evolves, you have a proton and neutron coming in with some initial energy and momentum. Something happens, and then out goes the proton and neutron system again. This is the elastic neutron proton scattering, and with some final energy and momentum. And um, stitching this idea together, working in the center of momentum frame, um, since total energy and momentum is conserved. Uh, the initial energy is equal to the final energy is equal to the just some energy I call E here. Uh, the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum, which I just called total momentum P. Uh, in the center of momentum frame, uh, P star is equal to zero. So this you know frame is back to back. So for elastic equal mass scattering, 
um, you can show that the initial relative momentum is equal to the final relative momentum, which again, I just call Q here. And the setup is what we have here, that you have the initial proton and neutron coming in, and then some scattering happens, happens, and then the proton and neutron fly off. Um, this scattering angle theta here is just the angle of the final uh, system with respect to the initial system. It may not be the same, you know, it, it may not be aligned, so it can be at any angle at all. This is the residual angular degrees of freedom. And again, uh, uh, just to remind you that the total momentum, that the relative momentum here in the center of momentum train is equal to one half the square root of this uh, center of, of momentum energy squared minus the threshold energy squared. Um, and exercise show this. Um, sometimes in experiments, you don't do these experiments in the center of momentum frame. So CERN does do colliders where you have a proton and uh, two protons heading at each other um, with equal and opposite momentum. Uh, here at Jefferson Lab is a fixed target uh, experiment uh, where you have a neutron coming in uh, or in, it, you know, if you had a neutron beam, uh, it would come in uh, to a proton that's stationary. Uh, we often call this the lab frame, where then the proton and neutron fly off at some angle and some momenta here. Um, uh, P lab here is the momentum of particle one, and the lab energy then is just the initial energy plus uh, the total energy of this incident neutron, which is given by the square root of m squared plus P lab squared. Um, and then the kinetic energy is just related by the uh, difference of the total energy minus m. And you can show, I won't show it here, that this q variable in the center of momentum frame is related to the kinetic energy of, of the neutron. I only say this here because in some of the data I give later, I give these relationships and it's, it should be you know, just so you have that information here. All right, so you can relate these two together by, uh, doing Lorentz transformations between these two different frames. Um, so the next, I'm going to stop here with these lectures because um, I'm afraid of giving too much. So next time we'll, we talk about the kinematics and kind of what the situation is. Here we'll talk about what scattering amplitudes are and kind of how to define them and their general properties. Um, but in the, so that's what I'll start with next time. Um, I'll ask for questions, but let me first show off uh, some stuff of this, these notebooks again. Let me make it bigger as well. So in these notebooks, um, when you run them, I've included everything in the, uh, in the preamble here, everything that is needed for all these notebooks. So just uh, run these things as is. You don't need to import anything else that was already here. Um, I define here a square root function um, that uses a different definition of its branch cut. If you're aware of branch cuts, the square root function is not defined uh, for negative values of, uh, you know, the square root of x is not defined for negative values of x, um, which that defines a branch cut in complex analysis. Here, we're going to rotate the branch cut to the right-hand side in order to align it with conventions that are done in scattering theory. I'll discuss why that is next time, but just note that this is why this is here. Um, this is just a trick to, to rotate the branch cut such that it's not defined from zero to positive uh, imaginary. And you can see here what I mean by this. Uh, so that's just a little filler uh, that we'll discuss a bit next time. The main point here, is that there's some discussion on the two particle kinematics that I just gave, along with some of the exercises that I just suggested. And um, one of the things here is uh, I'm going to work with units of mass as one and plotting, say, the center of momentum frame momentum, uh, which here you see the typical square root like behavior um, and some simple plotting routines that you can see. So you can give this a try yourself. Everything here is given to you. I'm not trying to make you guess at what to do. Uh, it's for you to run these things, try them out, and then try out these exercises with different values or uh, trying out for different projects you may have. 
And then uh, this next section just concerns the phase space factor, which is this factor here. Um, so this exercise one has some introduction to the kinematics that I just gave. And uh, in the case of the neutron proton system, um, let me, so there's uh, a utility here, which is called NP fit, which is neutron proton fit. Uh, so if you run it, Python NP fit, it's very bare bones. To go to the yeah. it's 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 very bare bones, so it doesn't require much input. Everything there is already fixed. Um, so it's going to print out a plot of uh, the theoretical fit curve along with some data here. Um, we'll discuss this more next time and kind of what's being output here. Uh, but the point here is that you can look at some of these routines. So NP fit util has some of the fitting um, uh, definitions I use to print my stuff out. And NP amplitudes has uh, uh, some information on units, which you have to do some unit conversions since these cross sections are measured in one unit and we often work with different units in the, in, in, in the theoretical construction and also some uh, kinematic definitions. So you can start playing with this now um, and it links up to some data that's given here in NP data. Um, but I'll discuss this this thing more next time. Um, uh, the main stuff I discussed today was in exercise scattering one. So just wanted to review that uh, uh, real quick. Uh, I'm always not sure kind of how to do this when I go very you know, if this is you know, self-evident or if this is not. So let me stop here then and ask for questions. Um, is there any questions? Which I, I'm now seeing there's some auto captioning going on, which is pretty neat. So I'm gonna close that because that's freaking me out. Uh, okay, any questions at all? Is this too, so let me ask someone to speak up, is, is this too remedial? Is this on the line, is this too advanced? I don't wanna, uh, how do we access the recordings? Uh, Paul, we need to answer that. Uh. Uh, yeah, the, record, the recordings will get um, edited and uploaded to YouTube, um, which by the way, I'm actually in the process of doing uh, yesterday's two talks. Um, Okay, so you have that available, that that material there. Uh, on the YouTube now though, I'm, uh, I know Paul linked me to my lectures from last year, which are, which cover the same topic, but uh, I discuss it differently. I don't discuss the case of neutron proton, so you can check those out. Um, also through my GitHub, there's also various lectures uh, that you can look at. And my website itself, uh, let me share my screen again. Should be sharing. Does this work? Go through my website, you can see here uh, this pretty face and then teaching. Uh, so here um, is a bunch of different material I've been involved with. Um, so there's material from the RPI summer school last year and I'll, I'll link up the videos uh, hopefully later today, we'll see. Um, I'm part of this summer program, which you're interested, check out the links uh, for the Regis uh, Nuclear Physics Mentor Program. Uh, here, there's some exercises and video lectures on basics of nuclear physics. Uh, this is geared more towards um, undergraduate students. Um, so, uh, but a lot of material is you know, similar. So you can kind of see some things that are interesting if it's interesting to you. Um, these numerical exercises were originally developed for the INT Summer School in Problem Solving and Lattice QCD in 2021. You can access video lectures here, which a colleague of mine, Raul Grisenio, gave lectures, and I uh, was responsible for the exercises, um, which cover some aspects of hydro spectroscopy from, but from the point of view of Lattice QCD. Uh, again, the first thing that I talked about is the scattering theory perspective, since that's 
really the necessary ingredient in order to understand the hadron spectrum. And then um, I already mentioned this before, but some lectures from uh, Indiana University Summer School on Reaction Theory um, in 2017 and 2015, I believe. Um, there's some also links there that you can check out that has some discussions on a lot of these topics. So, uh, so yeah, check out my website. Uh, where am I? At? So on my slides, here's my email. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, and then my website, you can check out for information that I've on these various topics.